me click the button. Thank you. We're welcome to uh, a gathering of friends on Sunday, two days before Valentine's Day, or uh, actually uh, day before Valentine's Day, excuse me, the day before Valentine's Day, February 13th. Uh, we're glad you got to join us, and we're going to talk about uh, the first few verses of Matthew uh, chapter 5. It's Jesus. Let me grab my books here. I've got a few things I want to share with you. Um, I, I encourage you to, uh, if you didn't get to read this, to read those three chapters, 5, 6, and 7. It's uh, a famous passage, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, and it's probably Jesus' longest recorded sermon um, and uh, very, very critical to his, why he came, why, why did God come to earth? And uh, this gives a picture of the kingdom of God, and we talk about the kingdom of God, and and I for years I said, well, where is the kingdom of God? Where I thought that was supposed to be here. Well, actually, in Second Corinthians it says we are ambassadors, so that means uh, we have uh, what do you call them when the where the ambassador lives? The I'm blank. I'm sorry. We have those little embassies. I'm sorry, embassies in this foreign country, this world where we live. Each of us is, a, is an embassy. Every church is a little embassy with ambassadors for the kingdom of God. So it's here, and it's also in fruition in where God is in heaven, which, by the way, is everywhere. So it's kind of a weird thing. It's everywhere, but it's but it's right here too. But remember, we're in the middle of this battle that's going on, this war. And so we are uh, Christ's ambassadors. Jesus is saying, this is what the kingdom looks like uh, when you're here. Now, uh, we don't know exactly where this took place. It's probably uh, close to the Sea of Galilee, probably near Capernaum somewhere. But it's, but it's up on a hillside. Uh, Jesus had only called four of the 12 disciples at the time he gave this. So we don't know if he was talking to a bunch of people or just a few people, uh, probably just a few because that, that's who could hear him. Uh, you know, not a whole bunch of people, but several close at hand. And it said the disciples followed him on up the hill his disciples. So anyway, Jesus was talking about this and uh, it was early in his ministry and he was introducing the kingdom of heaven. Now I said last week, and, and I think when we read this, we, we uh, at least I, and I think some of us have read this and thought of it as more a uh, uh, a list of rules and it says things like don't judge don't worry don't lust don't you know turn the other cheek don't do this do that do this do that and we've looked at it as kind of a list of rules and said okay well i've got to do these things in order to be a follower of christ and that's really not the idea God's not going to put a bunch of standards up uh, for you to be his child. Those of you who are parents, you don't say to your kids, well, you'll be my kid if you do these certain things or don't do these other certain things. That's not, that's not what you do. That's not how it works. But if you're my child, you will want to do these things. You will desire these things. You will 
you will show your love for me by doing these things. And that's, that's what Jesus was presenting. But in the first few verses we looked at, we're going to, we look at, we're going to look at uh, the Beatitudes. Now, uh, you've probably heard that term before, and blessed are the whatever, those kind of things. The, the word blessed, the word Beatitude comes from uh, blessed, which means happy or fulfilled, glad, uh, satisfied, not necessarily peaceful or shalom, but are, you're on track is what Jesus was saying. And also I want you to think about as he was saying these things, he was, he was not thinking of some theoretical crowd. He was, he was actually looking at people who were experiencing these things and he was saying to them, blessed are you if you are experiencing these things, knowing that they were. Uh, not all of them, but not all these things, but some of them were experiencing some of them. All of them were experiencing some of them. And so he was looking at them and saying to them, you're happy when these things are happening to you. And they were going like, what? Uh, because it, it didn't make sense to them. Remember, Jesus is presenting a, sort of an upside down way to look at things. We, we and these people had been uh, experiencing life uh, under Roman rule. They were, they were oppressed people politically, uh, even socially. Uh, they weren't necessarily desirous, uh, uh, didn't spend their days like we do, you know, trying to make a buck or, or get, get by, get their space, you know, and uh, hold on. They were looked at life, at things differently than we do, but somewhat the same too. They still had these God-given personal uh, desires and needs in their heart. And Jesus was looking at them saying, actually, that's a good thing because you will receive something else that you hadn't even thought about. You're thinking of it in worldly terms, but I'm telling you, this is what's happening. This is what's going to happen. And so you're blessed. So it was encouraging. It was also confusing. But it was the introduction to the, the new way, the new kingdom that Jesus came to introduce. So uh, let me let's uh, look at some of these the the As I said, uh, blessed or the Beatitudes means the happiness, the satisfaction, uh, uh, not, not an ethereal coming thing, but right now, what's going to happen to you is this. Um, and so the first thing he says is, uh, well, I'll, I'll tell you what, let's, let's just read the, the first 16 chapters for the First 16 verses. Uh, um, so Jesus says, when or the Bible says, when he saw the crowds, he went up, went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, which by the way, uh, was was typical. That was normal. Jesus did rabbinical things. He did. Uh, it was normal for the rabbi to sit down. We're used to our preachers standing up and preaching to us, but uh, rabbis are seated. They sit down at the same level as their followers. So Jesus sat down 
and his disciples came to him. That's where I was, I was telling you, he probably wasn't talking to the crowd. He wasn't standing up shouting at the crowd. He was just talking to those that were close to him. Then he began to teach them saying, blessed are the poor in spirit for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. Blessed are the humble for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. You are blessed when they insult you and persecute you and falsely say every kind of evil against you because of me. Be glad and rejoice because your reward is great in heaven. For that is how they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt should lose its taste, how can it be made salty? It's no longer any good for anyone, anything, but to be thrown out and trampled under feet. You are the light of the world. A city situated on a hill cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, but rather on a lampstand, and it gives light for all those who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and then give glory to your Father in heaven. So I, I, I uh, suspect that all of us have heard that before, read it before. Uh, it's been it's a familiar passage. Uh, we know the Beatitudes, and uh, probably have, have all heard sermons on them. So I'm gonna um, just remind you. Uh, of what the things are and then what the reward is that's going on. First of all, Jesus says the poor in spirit. Now, that's a person that's not, uh, we hear the word poor and we think of poverty. We think of money or uh, a poor person or something like that. Actually, what Jesus is talking about, a person that's poor in spirit is a person who understands that they have no uh, chance on their own of being called uh, a child of God or being called a good person or they they know they can't do it are, are you don't you don't have to answer me but are you aware of, of Aren't you aware of your failures? I am. I, I know that I can't do what I'm supposed to do. I'm poor in spirit. And, and that can be depressing. But Jesus says, if you're that way, if you understand you don't have any other way of getting where you need to go, then I'm offering you the way. You can receive you can have uh, the way. We may say, huh, how can I have the kingdom of God? It's, it's given to you. It's gifted to you. Uh, the, the poor in spirit get the kingdom of heaven. They know they can't have anything else. They can't get there any other way. They're ready to receive the kingdom of heaven. They surrender their claims to the world. As, uh, uh, material goods don't have a hold on them. They know that's useless. That's, that goes nowhere. Only God has what they need. And then uh, it says those who are mourn 
are blessed. Those who uh, um, with humility, I'm sorry, I couldn't, the, the humility is, is the first passage and then mourning is the second passage. Um, those who mourn uh, will be comforted. Those who are, we think of mourning as a, like for a loved one or something like that. But this is a, this is a, a mourning of hopelessness. I, I mourn the fact that in myself, like the first verse, I can't accomplish what needs to be accomplished. So um, I'm uh, poor in spirit and I mourn that. And God says, you'll be comforted and receive the kingdom of heaven. They kind of go hand in hand with each other. So you, you can't be prideful or convinced that, that you can make it and receive what God gives you. It excludes that. Uh, so, you know, a practical thing is we ask for God to bless something, what we're doing or something like that. But then we, our attitude is, I'll get it done. We haven't surrendered. Uh, we haven't realized that we can't do it. Only God can do it. And at that point, then he can intervene. Up to that point, he can't. His hands are tied. I hate to say God can't do anything, but he cannot overcome our decision, our free will. He gave it to us uh, to impose a better thing on us. So where do you maybe do that in your life? I can think of all the time I seem like I do that. And uh, I need to surrender to God in order to receive what he has in store. So verse five said, those who are meek. Now, again, we, we misinterpret the word or misunderstand the word meek. Um, we think of a, a meek and mild person, a very passive, non-aggressive uh, type of person who just takes whatever comes their way and what but the meek in this in this me excuse me the person who is meek understands that the life their life will be best when God's will is managing the, the whatever it is. So again, we're speaking about the, the pride of a person or the will of a person, the decision of a person to accomplish a thing. But when that is subdued, surrendered to God, when we say, I can't do it, when we're meek enough to say, I can't do it, then God can bless us and make us happy. This is a, a kind of like a well. We we uh, Dakota has horses that she trains, and uh, what she does is make them surrender, or or ask them to surrender to her will. So, but at the same time, they they keep their strength and uh, power uh, and, and ability to accomplish things, but it's done at her request. So we do the same thing with God. We surrender our abilities to him, and then he uses those abilities to do the best thing for us and others. That's the idea of meekness or humility. That's when we're happy, Jesus says. So then it goes to uh, hunger and thirst. 
blessed are those who hunger and thirst. Uh, that's the motivation for us to eat and drink, of course. If, if we don't consume enough food or drink enough water, we can die. Um, citizens of God's kingdom understand that the, the underlying need <coughs> to consume righteousness is what causes us to grow and be healthy and develop and, and have ability to do what we need to do. We can't be uh, malnourished in our spirit. We've got a hunger and thirst after righteousness, after God. Uh, and that allows us then to be blessed. Uh, you know, we can't even imagine what could go on, but um, that's what happens. Now, um, the next one is <clears throat> those who are merciful. Now, here's what we've got to go back to um, the, the historical context. Um, these people lived constantly in uh, fear of, you know, underlying fear of the, the Roman state. The, the, in other words, the Roman soldiers or authorities could do anything. They didn't understand mercy, so they, they could do anything they wanted to these people. We see later where uh, Jesus makes reference to uh, carrying their armor a second mile, go the second mile. Uh, that's just one, one thing that could be done. But there was no room for mercy. That was a, a foreign concept. That was a new concept to people of that time. They didn't think about being merciful. Now, we modern people uh, are polite. We are merciful. We may not always be with our words, but uh, at least we are in activities, generally speaking, we are merciful to each other. But in those days, that hardly existed. People were cruel to each other. And, uh, or we would call cruel. They just called it normal. That was just the way it was. So Jesus is saying, but if you're merciful, you'll receive mercy. You're going you're gonna to be happy because you're going to receive mercy. In other words, in God's kingdom, the merciful ones will receive it. Now we can say, well, that's just karma, for instance, but this is an intentional activity that goes on. So if we're trying to be merciful, then we'll receive it. In uh, those, finally, our, our next, it says, those that are pure in heart. Uh, people that are known by their word, uh, they, they stand as, as examples of integrity. Uh, they're not double-tongued. They don't say one thing and mean something else. Uh, you know, we've all done business with people like that who will, uh, the used car salesman who will tell you one thing and really it's not true. It's just a half truth. and or maybe just an outright lie and things like that. But uh, if you're pure in heart, you, you tell the truth, you live by the truth, you speak the truth, you're not trying to get by with something that, that's not going on. Duplicity, dishonesty, uh, uh, two messages out of your mouth are not part of the pure in heart. That's what he's referring to. Instead, they're innocent of that. They mark, they, they, that's the mark of the pure in heart. Innocent people who, who don't assume things, who don't uh, project things. I know uh, people who seem to uh, automatically assume the worst about people. 
They're suspicious of everything and everybody. Um, you know, nobody, nobody, they become so hardened that nobody tells the truth, including themselves. They always kind of hedge a little bit. But these aren't people who are gullible, but they're just simply tell the truth. Pure in heart. Uh, they're they're going to get their reward. That's who gets to live in the kingdom. And then there's peacemakers, those who are peacemakers. Now, that is uh, not a passive person who just wishes it was peaceful. Those are people who are active in uh, creating peace. They are uh, working to resolve conflict and more than, more than just resolving conflict. They are looking for and working towards uh, getting along. Okay, it's, it's more a universal situation that, that can be applied specifically. And, uh, you know, we're not all called to make peace with the world, but we may be in our family. We may be at home. We may be with our neighbor. And so we should be actively pursuing that. And the people who have a heart to do that, who want to do that, they may be apathetic and not busy about it, but they, they should be and they are desiring to do that. Those are the peacemakers. Those are the people who are blessed in the kingdom of God uh, by being a peacemaker. And then uh, <clears throat> it's, it talks about those who are persecuted. Um, there's, a, there's a theme of paradox, as you've seen in these verses. It's over and over, Jesus said, you, you, your thinking is worldly. So it doesn't seem like any of these things would bring happiness. And yet what I'm telling you, Jesus says, what I'm telling you is they will. That's my kingdom. Where opposites of what we think is gonna happen actually happens. Again, I, I call it upside down or backwards or whatever. The, the thinking is totally different, opposite from what we have considered to be the truth. Now, that's in, that's in this situation, you understand. So, again, the, the, the paradox is there. Jesus presents this as a paradox. It, certainly in the verse, verses 10, 11, and 12, that's seen there. Um, the, 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 all the verses have, have uh, kind of indicated a, a persecution, a suffering. And now Jesus brings it, the point being when you are these things, there are going to be people and systems that will persecute you, that will say you're wrong, that will try to defeat you, cause suffering for you. But only in a worldly sense can they reach you. So uh, take heart. Your happiness is coming and assured. Um, and, and, you know, we're not exceptions to the rule of being persecuted. We, we're, not, we're not above Jesus. He was persecuted. And so we, the Bible says, we should expect the same. And so we shouldn't be surprised. Rather, we should be thinking, of the blessing that brings to us. So then, uh, anybody have any thoughts on any of these that they want to share? Yeah, a couple of things. 
the, one of them that really made the, a big impact on me is the example or parallel you gave between uh, Dakota and the strength of the horses and um, their submissiveness. I thought that was a beautiful picture of meekness and it started making me think about, well, for each one of the Beatitudes, is there another analogy we could, that, that would be with that same kind of impact, you know? Yeah. But because, because it, you know, Beatitudes, I think is something that's hard for most people to grasp, including myself, but that might help. And then of course, you know, the, the idea that um, you could, somebody can say, you know, Jesus is doing the opposite of the world, but really, in a sense, is the world doing the opposite of what Jesus would do. I mean, they're the one, yeah. the world is the one that's wayward, you know, not not Jesus. So framing it in such a way like you have that uh, he is the standard, uh, uh, he is the right one. <laughs> Everybody else is screwed up. The other, the world's yeah. way of looking and it is what's wrong. But that's very good. We, uh, I, I, I think of Larry, the, again, I've, I've said this a few times, but our, our minds are conditioned to think in a worldly way, okay? Our mamas and daddies, their mamas and daddies, their mamas and daddies, all the way back, teachers, even preachers, politicians, on and on and on. Everybody who has something to say that has some influence, or just about everybody, the majority of, I'll say, are telling us the way to do it. And, and we think it's good is to do this and do this and do this. And Jesus shows up and says, no, that's not right. We say, oh, no. Is everybody in the world wrong except you? You know, so we're hard to convince. But then we we. We hear his words, and, and you notice that scripture says, or you, as you've read, I'm, maybe you've noticed, that several times it said people were amazed at Jesus' teaching because he spoke with such authority. They were, they were taken aback. So... You know, this, this, I mean, the emperor said certain things, the king said certain things, and the people said, yeah, that's what we're allowed to do. That's right. Well, they, uh, they were, if they didn't, they were, they would get punished. You know, that sounds like a good thing. So I'll go along with that. And they kept on and kept on and kept on. And they finally just became normal. That's just the way they thought. But then Jesus comes along and says, wait a minute. It's actually the other way, but our brains are already conditioned to think this way. Uh, let's bring it to modern times. We are taught, or I was taught, the American way. The American way. You know, pull yourselves up by your bootstraps. Uh, make your way. Get your money, get a good job, get an education, et cetera, et cetera. That's the American way. That's what we hear. That's what our mamas and daddies said. Their mamas and daddies goes back many generations. So we're raised to think that way. And then here comes Jesus. 2,000 years ago, he showed up, but it's still written down for us. Then we read Matthew 5 and we go, wait a minute. He's saying something different. That doesn't make sense. So we have trouble in our heads and in our hearts accepting that this is true. And we may, we may say, no, I'm a Christian. 
And so I believe it's true. Do we live it? Do we really go out and act like it? Maybe, maybe not. So saying one thing and then doing it are two different things. That's actually one of the things he talks about here, being duplicitous. So, uh, you know, Paul says in Romans, renew your minds. Let, let those, let that old way of thinking, that worldly way of thinking, instead become God's way of thinking. And, and, you, and that takes some time. That doesn't happen immediately for most of us. We have to continue to develop that. That's why we say, read scripture, pray, spend time with God, journal. Do those disciplines so that your mind becomes renewed over time. So anyway, that, that's, that's brief. But Larry, you're right. I, I, was, uh, I read that, actually, I, and I, I thought of that. It was, it was so applicable. The horse is still strong. The horse is a 1,500-pound is a muscle. You know, I'm, I'm looking at them out here in the pasture. I'm, I, I don't want them to step on my feet. It hurts. They're big and strong, and they can bite and kick me and whatever else. They can do that. And yet they have surrendered their wildness, their will, so to speak, to mind. That's what God is saying. If you will be strong, but let me use your strength to do what I have in store, you're going to be blessed. So that's just one, one picture of that. Don't, the other thing is, uh, you know, be honest. Don't, don't your integrity. Be, be that person. Now, a lot of us don't have trouble with that. We're all, we're all pretty honest people most of the time. Uh, but but when it when the rubber hits the road, are we really uh, we really going to say what we feel, what we believe is a truth, or are we are we going to hold back? Sometimes being dishonest is not speaking. You don't you don't have to tell a lie. Sometimes you need to say what's true, and instead you just keep your mouth shut. Same thing. The damage is done. Uh, might be a little thing, might be a big thing. There's a problem though. And you do that hundreds of millions of times, and you end up with a world like we've got. <laughs> you know, and, and on and on through these through these things when we're when we're not meek when we're not poor in spirit uh, there's there's one the very first one when we think we can do anything good a good thing but anything when we think our power controls the situation we've got a problem do that a hundred million times billion times we've got what we've got see see where it, ends, it takes us as opposed to if we had done a hundred billion times what jesus said to do where would we be today would the would the kingdom be a great thing and there would just be little outposts of non-kingdom <laughs> You know, it makes you wonder. So let's go on and, and talk about uh, the salt and light. We say that a lot, that Christians should be, one, Christians should be salt and light. Um, one thing I read about that, that we need to consider is that the salt in those days wasn't as pure as what we have. So that is important in we, when we think about what it's doing, and especially when it's thrown out, 
uh, it, it becomes no good, it's thrown out. So that kind of gives us an idea of the perspective where it's coming from. But uh, Jesus was using metaphors uh, as we see of the salt and light. In this case, he used them constantly. Uh, we're not literally salt or literally light, but we're not a lamp or salt on a salt shaker, but we should act like those things. Um, think about the characteristics of salt and light. He pointed out, probably pointed to a city where you could see the lights. Now, again, this is we got to think a little different. We're we're uh, used to light. Uh, we can flip a switch and light up a room. It's no big deal. Uh, when we end up in the dark, we're kind of what do we do? Our thinking is we got to light this up. At the time that Jesus said this, dark was normal. Not only not only literally, but uh, spiritually too. But, but dark was normal. The world was dark, physically very dark. There was very little to give light. There was no electricity. The only light you had was a candle or a torch or an oil lamp or something. And that gave much less light than the uh, fluorescent or incandescent lights that we use today or LED. So it was a, being a light to the world was a huge thing to people to hear that. Uh, it's kind of hard for us to con conceptualize that. Uh, but to drive out the darkness, a light, the light would get rid of the darkness, that was a big deal in their minds, okay? Um, we understand it, but it's a little different for us in that. And uh, of course, same can be said with salt. Uh, we've got refrigeration and freezing and uh, all kinds of ways, canning to, to preserve food. Uh, it's it's no big deal to us, even even those of you who might can your own fruit or stuff like that. It takes some effort, but it's not a huge deal. But back in that time, just getting salt was a big deal. When they had to either eat something right away, just get what they needed, no way to store it. Uh, they either had to do that or they had to get salt and preserve it, which changed the taste, changed the whole makeup of the thing. So this was a big, big, big deal to these people to hear this. And we need to uh, hear it as close as we can. We need to hear it the same way. So uh, Jesus says it would be silly for you to light a light as as big a deal as that is, and then hide it under a basket. Why would you do that? That would, to, to people that heard Jesus uh, doing that would be stupid. Don't waste the money on the oil or the candle or whatever it is and put it under a basket. If you need light, you need light. So uh, in, in, in a city, that's giving light off can't be hidden. It's, it's going to shine. So you be the same way. You be the preservative. You be the flavoring. You be the salt of the earth. Uh, that's what, and again, folks, that doesn't mean, I, I don't know how I can emphasize this anymore, but that doesn't mean I have to try harder to be salt and light. Um, what it means is 
I will be salt and light if I let Jesus be my king. If I position myself, uh, condition myself, discipline myself, pride, arrogance, things like that, if I put those aside and let Christ be over me, then I will be a kingdom person who gives salt, is salt, and gives light. Does that make sense? I, I don't know how I can express it. So many of us, including me, uh, try to be those things when actually we're doing it with our own power. We may not realize it, but we're trying to do those things in our own strength. And we can't do it. We, we can't do big things. We can't do little things. Jesus has to do those for us. Surrender is a key. Larry said it a few weeks ago. It keeps coming back. That Surrendering my will to God's is what creates, makes us into what we need to be. It was very, uh, also, Jesus said, um, not just having light. He didn't say you're just going to have light. He said, be light. <laughs> uh, don't just have Jesus, be Jesus. You will be Jesus. So that was a big deal too, that they heard that, they understood that, and how profound that was. Uh, to, to think that way, to, again, folks, this was so different. This was so, uh, what's the word? It, it just wasn't like anything I'd ever heard before. So radical. Uh, and, and we have, uh, I wouldn't say normalized it, but we've made it almost insignificant. We've, we've rationalized it away in, in modern times. And uh, we've got to get back to hearing how profound the words of Jesus are uh, in this sermon. Do you remember the first time you heard this? The Beatitudes, do you, do you remember what, a, what effect or effect it had on you? Uh, I can't really recall that myself. I've, I've heard it so many times, but uh, I do remember thinking, maybe not the first time, but I do remember thinking often that, uh, oh goodness, I'm not, I'm not any of those. I'm not meek. I'm not poor in spirit. I'm not whatever it said. I'm not persecuted. Uh, so, it, it kind of worried me in a way. I felt guilty that I wasn't in the kingdom or wasn't part of the kingdom. And, and for me, the understanding was the acceptance of the mercy of God, the grace of God to make me able to be that kind of person. Do you, uh, do you desire really the, the, the kind of happiness that is talked about? Remember, this is a, this, this word, uh, blessed, uh, we, we, it's a church word. We use it all the time. You know, well, be blessed, you're blessed. 
et cetera, it's really a significant, it's a big deal. And we have sort of trivialized the meaning of the, of the fulfillment of the, of the total happiness, satisfaction that the word means. And uh, we said, well, we say, I'm, you know, I'm kind of blessed. There's no such thing as kind of blessed. <laughs> you either are or you aren't. Uh, so uh, try to try to. I don't know how to explain it any better, but try to uh, incorporate that what Jesus is saying and how profound that is uh, to the people that are hearing it, even in that word. Anybody have any other thoughts on uh, the the beatitudes or the salt and the light that Jesus not only promises to give us, but that we can share? Well, it's a great day, y'all. Uh, remember to uh well uh, I, I should have said this first uh let me ask you do do any of you have uh, uh, any prayer need or particular thing today you'd like to share with us that we can uh pray about anything at all i shared with you earlier about uh, our friend Cheryl having surgery on Wednesday. We want to pray for her. Uh, hope that'll go smooth and pray that that'll go smooth and recover and be quick. Anyone else? Well, we need to pray for good results on your uh, test this week. <laughs> yeah, I guess there's a little bit of me that's, that's worried about uh, what they saw last time, but uh, the doctor wasn't too concerned and maybe it was just, uh, you know, it's kind of, well, I need to follow up because I need the money or whatever. <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. Uh, in case you didn't hear, I don't know if y'all were here, but um, Jan probably knows, I guess. But I saw Billy and Stacy on Friday about five o'clock or so, and uh, Chase was doing real well. He got into a home, a group home in DeSoto. Uh, he likes it there, making friends, doing well. And so we were glad to hear that about Chase. So keep praying for that situation, praying for him. Anything else? Uh, okay, March 6th, we're going to, uh, gather again. Hopefully, you can all be there, or at least we're planning on it. So, we'll see you then. Let me let me share this with you. I, I kneel, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of His glorious riches, He may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. So we talked about renewing our minds. This is asking God to change us uh, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Give me more faith, Lord. Give us more faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know that his love surpasses knowledge. We can't even understand it. Although we want to, Lord, please give us a, a sense of the surpassing love that you have for us. 
that you may be filled to all the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is work within us, at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Go and be uh, what God calls you to be, salt and light. Let's do that this week, every day. Uh, in Jesus' name I ask it and I pray in his authority. Amen. Amen. See you, folks. Love you all very much. Have a great day. See ya. Bye-bye. We'll be making nachos.